on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We recap the nail biter between OU and UCF. We also recap the other great games of week eight in college football, and we give you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hosty will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Sunday, October 22nd, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, Craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts. And to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of October, all you got to do is visit Riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now recording this Sunday morning, please leave us a five-star review and a nice comment. An ugly win is better than an ugly loss. That was, that was entirely too close for comfort for me, Ted. Yeah, and gosh, the way the defense got off the field on that first three and out, I was like, okay, we're about to have a great game. And then the first offensive series was like, uh, okay, we're, we'll be fine. Defense three and out. And then after the second offensive series, it's like, Hmm, is this going to be one of those days? And it was one of those days. It was, it was absolutely one of those days. Now we're going to break this game down. The only way we know how going to be critical, but fair. So let's get to it. If you are looking for us, to yell and scream and that people need to be benched and people need to lose their jobs. We've said it before. We'll say it again. I'm sure this is not that podcast. We are going to, it's, it's never as good as it seems. It's never as bad as it seems. So let's dive into it. Ted, what did you see from OU's defense against UCF? Well, it's weird. There's, a whole lot of good there's really long stretches of good football um we completely dominated the line of scrimmage um i thought for the most part we had good pressure on the quarterback i thought we we tackled really well um it's really when you boil it down it's a handful of plays in that game um now those handful of plays were were just killers right the the really long touchdown um on that little or i don't even know what you call it or it's not really an rpo it's i i don't know where where it looked like Plumley was going to pull it down we had him covered um you know and woody washington just came off his guy got the wires crossed a little bit maybe he thought he had a safety over the top i'm not sure there but um, that turned into a huge touchdown. Um, that had two reverses on us, you know, and that's something that you we knew going in that Malzon is is good at is using your aggressiveness against you. They had a pretty nice little plan for that. Hit us on big chunks on those, and then the sprint draw. It's a tough play. It's a weird play. It's the way it's blocked is unconventional, but. It is super dangerous, especially when you have a quarterback like Plumley and they run sprint pass a bunch. It's it's a really dangerous play, and they hit us on that a handful of times for a, a big chunks of yardage. Um, you know, there were some nice plays by UCF. There were about three or four really nice uh, throw and catch route, nice route, nice throw from Plumley, whenever he was, you know, as he's getting hit, he made some really nice throws that final touchdown throw all the way across that it's, that was a tough route and a really good throw. We defended it pretty good. It was just, they put us in a tough spot. So give them credit for some of the things they did, but 
most of it totally self-inflicted. Positive is, I think it's stuff that's easily correctable. Now, maybe we see someone else implement the sprint draw on us because we gave up so much on it. I'm sure they're going to practice it. They're going to walk through exactly how they want to defend that. It's just a good play. Uh, I'm surprised more people don't run it as much as, as much, especially in this conference, as much as we see sprint pass, I'm shocked that no one else has, has uh, added that into what they did. Um, just to mention some guys that I thought played well. Um, I thought Stutzman played well. Uh, I thought, I thought Kanick. There's a couple of flashes in there where he looks great. He looks fast. He's decisive. And then there's some periods in there where he's, um, his late, his eyes, you know, he's still, he's still not really seeing the blocking schemes good enough. So he gets caught in misdirection, misdirection really bad, which I, I still think is, is a experience issue. And I think he's going to be coming around. Remember, he's just, he's seven starts in. Uh, so still hasn't in the grand scheme of things played a whole lot of football. Um, I thought, Jason McCola was was good on the limited amount that he was in. Thought he did some good things. Still needs to work on pad level. Uh, a couple of times he's too high. They had us in a bunch formation once that I think he and he and PJ were misaligned to, and uh, they hit us on a chunk there. Um, I thought Billy Bowman played really well. Is is he at fault on one of those seam balls late? Maybe, but, you know, overall, he plays with an extreme high level uh, of of energy. He's physical. He's all over the field. For the most part, he's directed traffic. Thought he played good. Thought Kendall Dolby played good. Reggie Pearson didn't play a whole lot, but whenever he was in, I thought he was uh, really good, physical. And uh, And Peyton Bowen, same thing. Didn't play a whole lot, but whenever he was in there, he was effective. Um, I have for the defensive line guys that I thought played well, Isaiah Coe, Bothroyd, Lacey, Jonah Luulu, Trace Ford with an asterisk. We'll get to that. Uh, R. Mason Thomas, Dejon Terry, and Ethan Downs. That's pretty good when you have eight guys across the front edge and defensive line that played well. I I thought that they completely controlled the line of scrimmage. When, when you think about what UCF is as a team, right? The run game is a massive part, right? They were one of the best rushing teams in the country coming into the game. It has a lot to do with the mobility at the quarterback position. When you look at it, but they had 41 rushes for 149 yards pretty good half half of it came on two plays yep. uh, i mean you had 39 rushes go for essentially 75 yards what i think we had what did we have 15 tackles for loss in the game Is i think they were credited i've got it right here they were credited with 13 13 yeah that's a lot <laughs> that's a lot of tfls all right but and this is something you talk about all the time Defense is weird, man. You can be, I thought they were lights out for 95% of the snaps in the game, just dominant. And a handful of plays and your offense sputtering and not taking advantages, uh, taking advantage of the field position early in the game, right? Not cashing in. All of a sudden you're in a ball game. You give up a handful of big plays and, you're almost losing on your own field. It's just you defensive guys, man. You guys just that's gotta be it's gotta be it's, stressful. It's tough, yeah. You know, it's and I it it's bad because you can play like individually, you can play a great game, but you know, have have one mess up and you know, it it costs you. It's a long touchdown. And I know a bunch of Fingers going to be pointing at it at some different individual players, but like it's it's that's just the nature of the beast. 
um, a couple of things. I thought, so obviously there's a, a lot of talk about the taunting penalty on the long touchdown, right? Blowing kisses at about like the, what, the 20, 25 yard line. Are you, are you going to mention the guy that tweeted us and told us we didn't know the rules revealing that he obviously did not know the rules himself? Yeah, that was, I think he's had enough of that. <laughs> um, I think he made which, his account private, which is hilarious. You know, and that's, I guess I, I probably shouldn't have, have. You didn't, all you that, said was LOL, which was uh, pretty funny. Um, well, they could have thrown the flag right there for sure. In my opinion, I it's a dumb rule. I agree. I guess I know what they're trying to accomplish with it, but it is in the rule book. It probably should have been called. And, you know, that's fine. I say you get what you deserve, and we deserved to give up a touchdown on that play. Um, now, the Canic 15-yarder on the goal line. It was going to be, was it going to be fourth and goal? That was the third, third and goal stop. So it was going to be fourth down. Maybe they kick a, a field goal there. They probably do. I guess I don't know for sure. But after getting stuffed three in a row, and I know they watched that Texas, they're probably kicking a field goal there. And I think it was the right call. Because, only because, I, is it a soft call? Yeah. But I I I think you if if you're gonna make that mistake because it is a mistake and there's really no reason for it, I think that you you gotta face the consequences, right? And I just I I hated that that was called, but whenever you have something that's totally uncalled for, like there's no reason for it at all. I think you've got to be totally open to to the circumstances, and it's a great learning experience, right? It cost us maybe uh, four points in this game, but maybe the fact that they threw the flag, he's going to learn a very hard lesson from it. Maybe that saves us in a game of huge importance whenever he's thinking about doing something like that, and he doesn't. And it saves us. I think it's a hard lesson learned, but I think it can be a valuable lesson learned. That's an interesting perspective. I thought it was BS, but yeah. you, you know me. I like, I, I think that stuff is, I think they should let more of that stuff go in college football. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with guys talking trash. And it's it's funny because as I watched it unfold, it was not a penalty two weeks ago in the Cotton Bowl. Right. But what 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 those guys have to realize is, and it's always been this way, they let more stuff go in that game. They always yeah. have. When it comes to stuff like that, right? Showing emotion, you know, playing with that intensity. Like they let more stuff go in that game. And I guess the refs decided they weren't going to let it go in this yeah. one. I. I just hate when when the refs have that type of impact on a game, if that makes it like that's a huge play in that football game. Who knows how that game unfolds if that penalty isn't called? I mean, we'll never know. But I just I feel I've always felt that no one's getting hurt by a guy yelling in another guy's face when they make a huge defensive stop. I just, it, it's always been silly to me. I understand. Is it probably a penalty under the letter of the law? Yeah. But I've just always thought it's stupid. I've always wanted, wanted college officials, college football in general to be super emotional. So I get why they threw the flag. I still think it's stupid, but that's me. It is very stupid i if i didn't make that let me make it clear i think i think you should be able to say anything you want at any time on the field now, as long as i disagree with that <laughs> well I, I guess within reason um within reason there you go like things that happen on on a football field like i guess obviously not if we're going to 
I, I, you know, I, I think these are big boys and they can handle words being thrown back and forth at each other. I mean, they knocked the hell out of each other for three and a half hours. Exactly. Now, and yelling in a guy's face is a 15 yard penalty and extends a drive. It just when you think about it, it's hilarious. Like what? Yeah. yeah. No, it's yeah. Especially we could talk about this nonstop, but it, here's the thing. It was ugly at times defensively. It looked great. Uh, it looked really good. A bunch. We dominated the line of scrimmage. Like I said, I have, I have eight guys listed here that I thought played well on the defensive line. To me, th- that's a, a real big positive. It, they and it looks so much different than it looked at the beginning of the year. Guys are with their hands controlling people at the line of scrimmage. It looks really good. Uh, one of the most improved guys has to be Jacob Lacey. He looks he looks really good. Our Mason Thomas being back out there helped. He looked really good a couple of plays. So there's a couple snaps, and, and let me know if you disagree, Ted. I thought R. Mason Thomas looked like the best player on the entire field. Yeah, he looked long. He looked strong. He was locking tackles out. Good body lean. If if he can stay healthy, if that ankle can stay right, he's going to be a big piece for this team down the stretch, and they need him to be. His physical tools, his explosiveness, that get-off he's got, they need that. Right, They absolutely need that. So seeing him and seeing some of those flashes, it wasn't like the consistency wasn't what I wanted it to be. But a couple of the flashes, I went, ooh, yeah, that. Sign me up for more of that. He's got really good length. He runs well. Um, you, you just you get all you get all hot and sweaty when you think about 32 and 34 being on opposite sides. Oh, boy. Whenever they're really locked in. But um, I mean, there's some positives there. It, it, this is ugly. There's, we, let's point fingers everywhere. That's fine. What, but to me, it's a handful of plays. I don't think there's anything chronic that we see from one week to the next that we're sitting here pounding the table saying eventually this is going to burn us. Uh, sprint draw is a tough play, man. I, I've watched as Texas. I told the story about this in 2002. Quentin Griffin ran for like 300 yards on this one play over and over and over. It's tough. So I'm I'm not too worried about that. The reverses and stuff, you know, peeking inside disciplined football, a couple of those. I You know, I was going to talk about the Trace Ford. You know, he is incredibly productive, but he has a tendency to have these moments where it's like, what? <laughs> what what happened on that one? Where'd you go? Um, you know, peeking inside or, you know, lining up off sides, some of those things. But gosh, his production is is excellent. But that's a good lesson to learn on some of these reverses and the the sprint draw stuff because Kansas is the same way. Their offense is the same way. So we need to learn these lessons and dial back in on responsibility football and and, um, you know, you got to play 100% of the snaps great, not 95 or, or 92. I think just from talking to some of the guys after the game, I think they worked the sprint draw play a lot in practice. I, I, I talked to them before the game about it, and they were. I talked to Kanick about it after the game in the locker room. And he essentially said, BV is going to be so pissed. He he said that was the one play that they worked over and over and over again. And as the defense as a whole was like, they are not going to have success on this play. And well. Well, and I'll say Harvey was, is runs it really good. You know, he's a good he's, player. They got some good players, man. I thought that I thought Harvey was really good. I thought Plumley played yeah. a solid game. Now, I also thought that the defense gave his legs too much respect in the game. I thought they paid too much attention to him with where he was at health wise. He was not a threat running like a big threat. I I thought that they treated him 
they just gave his ability to, to run. They treated him like he was 100% and he wasn't. I, I thought that was an error. But Javon Baker, that guy can play. Man, yeah. they got a couple skill guys that are talented, man. Yeah, they are. Um, and I, I think their offense really, really – they they use their tools really well. Uh, they hide their weaknesses really well. I, if you were to watch that team, you would think that. And I don't. I'm not to say that their offensive line is bad, but they're just you know, they don't push people off the ball like like you would think. Whenever you look at those rushing numbers that they put up, but yeah, Plumlee had some really nice throws out there under pressure. Number one is a beast of a wide receiver. Um, so I. You know, that's a, again, it's ugly, but that's a good win. You look across the rest of college football, not everyone's winning those games when they show up and they're, they're undefeated and they're playing someone they should, should handle pretty easily. Anything else about OU's defense? I think that's it. No panic moments, some stuff they need to clean up. In the grand scheme of things, I think games like this probably do you more good. You can learn and grow more from games like this than you can – just showing up and you know cleaning up but it'd be nice to show up and clean up on some people out down the stretch no doubt the only other thing i had in my notes about the defense you know peyton bowen had a big play late on the sack first of all don't know how Plumley held on to that ball I know. that was that was impressive now completely just busted protection from ucf on that one but peyton bowen looked hurt yeah to me we didn't see a lot of him Right. And with how dynamic and how well he's been playing, I my hope is that's not something that's going to linger. But even just seeing him walking down on the sideline, had a little hitch in the giddy up, something's going on there. So hopefully, you know, the injuries have piled up a little bit in the secondary. Yeah. And Peyton Bowen's a guy that this team needs down the stretch. So hopefully that's something that can, that he can get right quickly. Yeah. And, and it's, kind of back to the what we said before we're deep until we're not right in you know when you lose some of that experience all of a sudden it, it looks pretty hairy back there um but i yeah i think you're right because even whenever he made that sack it just didn't seem like he was i, I think it was painful whatever happened in that like the celebration the energy from him was a little bit different but still uh and you said it during the broadcast he's got it Whatever it is, like when he's out on the field, he he shows up and makes plays. I I said that, man. That sounds good. That sounds good. I know. That, that came out of my right. dumb face. Yeah, it was great. How about that? All right, let's talk about what we saw from OU's offense against UCF. But first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Loves Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Loves Connect app unlocks exclusive deals can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Loves Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Loves Travel Stops. Loves also has you covered if you forget your phone, charger, or headphones with their expanded mobile-to-go zone. And, of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Hummer. It's hunting time in Oklahoma, and if you're looking to buy some hunting property, the Land Doctors can help you find the ideal ranch. They build custom hunting lodges and lakes and can turn Oklahoma's raw land into your personal playground. If you like to sell some land or simply want to add to your portfolio, they call Colton Cole at 405 615-7645 615-7645 or visit LandDoctors.com. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across OU Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletics events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Schooner All-American Ale, the taste of game day. OU's offense against UCF's defense. I'll start with the positive. When they absolutely needed to put drives together in the fourth quarter, right? when they were in jeopardy of losing the football game, 
they put scoring drives together and went and scored touchdowns. They ran it well. Dylan Gabriel made good decisions with the football. They did some really good things. And they deserve credit for that. Like, you were supposed to be at your best in the fourth quarter. And they were. Now, it, it's also possible that the guys from Kings of Leon deserve a lot of credit, too. That place was dead. <laughs> the only thing that brought them to life is like, oh, that's awesome. The Kings of Leon guys are here. Every, that, it, it, I really believe it got the crowd back into the game. It was so strange to witness. It was, yeah. it was cool. It was awesome for those guys. But it was a sleepy game, you know, 11 a.m. And just kind of the way it unfolded, the crowd was, you know, it wasn't the crowd's fault. It was just kind of the way the game was. It, it didn't have any really big moments. The goal line moment was pretty big, but, you know, I, they needed something and they grabbed a hold of that. I, I talked to Jared about it after the game and he said, yeah, they just told us to go out there and wave. And we're like, no, we got to get this place going. And they did. They did. I, cool. It sounds crazy, but I thought they made a difference. Uh, I really did. Now, while the offense did what they had to do in the fourth quarter, it's just way too inconsistent, man. It, it's just way too inconsistent. Uh, that defense for UCF, that is not a good defense. It's not a good, it's not a good defense. Now they've got some talent. Right. And I, I think their secondary is solid. And those guys played at a high level. But we talked about leaning into the game. The wide receivers were going to have to handle the physicality, right? all the grab and all the hold. And credit to UCF. The refs let all of that stuff go. And, and they, for the most part, played a nice game in the back end of the defense. But when you have a chance to create separation early, you have to take advantage of those chances. UCF went three and out on their first four drives of the game. And I know that Zach Schmidt missed two field goals. I understand that. But you have to be better offensively. When your defense is lights out, four three and outs in a row to start the game, you got to be up 17 nothing, 21 nothing. You, you have to make them pay in the field position. You couldn't ask for a better field position. I, I was really disappointed that they didn't take advantage of those situations early in the game. And there are a couple of, couple of things in this game that stood out to me. I, I feel like Venables and the staff, they've done a really good job with clock management. I thought they mismanaged the two minute situation before the half. Should have used the timeout. What was it? Farouk had like a nine-yard catch. Too much time came off the clock. Take the timeout. Right? It almost looked like they were trying to thread the needle too, too much. much to score with right as the clock expired. Yeah. Right? I'm, I'm with you. So now you end up getting the field goal there, but it, I, I, I did not think that was managed well. I, I am... I'm not going to crush the offensive line when we get there, but there's just not enough movement, man, in, in the run game. And I've talked a lot about my – I've, I've expressed a lot of my thoughts on kind of the running concepts, the core concepts of this offense, but they are what they are. You got to move guys off the football. And, and they did not move guys off the football, but – with the way that the defense started this game, I this should have been a two or three score win for Oklahoma if the offense, in my opinion, would have held up their end of the bargain. And I I just do not think that they played very well. Credit yeah. to them putting those drives together in the fourth quarter, right? When they had to have it, they went and got the job done. But this game being this close, I thought it was on the offense. Yeah. Um just a one quick comment on the the first four drives whenever the the defense three and out on them and not coming up with enough points the reason that matters obviously you want to put points on the board but the reason you have to take advantage of that at that point whenever it happens is it changes the way 
the other team calls plays against our defense. The further they fall behind, the more predictable they become, the more chances they have to take. And that's whenever you really can put the stranglehold on someone whenever they become desperate and do things that they otherwise wouldn't be forced to do. Um, you know, you force them to to have to drop back pass more. You have they have to take some risk, throw the ball into coverage, and and you can you could really attack them and be more aggressive in some moments as a defense. So that's why those things matter. It's not just putting points on the board. It's whenever you have opportunities to do so, it affects the rest of the game, not just that moment putting points up there. It makes the rest of the game easier to play. Yeah, and doesn't even mention like what it does for the crowd. Yeah. Right? It, that There was the opportunity to get that place going. Right out of the gate. Right out and, of the gate. And they did not seize that opportunity as an offense. And it probably would have been a UCF team. There was uh, what sounds like they perha- perhaps had some illness going through the team. Like, if you three and out them four times in a row and go – put in three touchdowns or something, it's 21-0 before the first, qu- first quarter even clicks off. That's a team that's probably like, okay, well, this was fun. We'll, you know, let's let's wrap this thing up and get on the plane and go home. But yeah. we gave them a reason to stay in the fight for the whole game. Yeah, and then they started feeling it, right? They started believing, and it's coming down to a two-point conversion. Yep. Or, and then the onside kick, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Stogner. <laughs> Way to go, Stogner. We'll get to that. Okay, let's hit let's hit these guys individually real quick offensively. Dylan Gabriel, uh, 25 38, 253, three touchdowns, had the interception. He was at his best in the fourth quarter. Right? They needed him to be really good in the fourth, and he was. But overall, I thought it was a pretty average performance from DG. He's he's capable of more. The interception, right? The throw is there. The ball's just late. Right? It's like this inside zone RPO concept. He's reading the safety. The ball should be on Drake sooner. Like that collision shouldn't be taking place when it took place. Mm-hmm. Right? If the ball's on time, it's throw, catch, probably, in you're moving the chains. But instead, it's late. He gets blasted. Guy makes a nice play on the ball. And you are, and you're throwing an interception, but he, he was smart when he took off and ran. Like, I love that he's not taking any big hits, right? For the most part, when, when he's taking off and running, where he's keeping it and some of these read concepts, some of this RPO stuff. But yeah, t- it just felt like an average performance from DG, right? Like, did you, did you, did you see it differently? No, I think that's right. I thought, uh, maybe at, you know, he took that one sack where he worked out of the, I think it was a three-man rush. He worked out of the pocket, got himself some space, and then came back into the pocket. Don't do and that. Got, and got blasted. Um, that was a tough one. Um, I I also thought that he stared down some guys and was, like, hitching at them and then threw the ball there, which is super dangerous. Um, and I think even the Drake Stoops, play that you're talking about like dangerous you're throwing him into contact anyways but I think he stared that one down and like you're saying it's late it is late but it's not that he's here and then coming to it late he's like staring it and then it's late which is the worst way to to be late yeah so uh, I think DG can be better that being said he I, I haven't checked the odds he may be he may be the odds-on favorite to win the Heisman Trophy right now. There's dropping light flies around him, right? More I mean, Washington anything. survived, but Penix was not good yeah. in that game. So uh, I haven't there's checked There's some it. weeks like that, you know. There's going to be some, like, it looked like everyone halfway through the season was like, there's some bad football out there, you know. There's some real bad football. Everyone yeah. needs a little bit of a regroup moment. All right, running backs, uh, the running game continues to not be explosive, right? I was hoping that this would be the week that it would break out, and it did not. Tommy Walker did not play. 
was not on the sideline. Uh, this is what I'll say about that situation. Got to move on. Got to make up. Everyone involved. I expect him to be back for the Kansas game. Just going to leave it at that. And this is the frustrating part for me. There's just no doubt that him not being available for that game hurt the football team. So figure that thing out, man. Because they needed him. And they almost lost the damn game. So figure it out. Yeah. Everyone, figure it out. Not going to say any more about it other than that. Right. Well, I I guess I can't say anything at all about it because, number one, I don't know. Number two, I'm with you. It, it's whatever we got to do to get the best guys out there, let's, let's get the best guys out there. And, I mean, that's – you hate to see – we made it through it, right? We made it through, but if you don't, you don't want to be looking back on on something like that and feel like that cost everyone an opportunity. Yes. Just figure it out. Marcus Major, the more I watch him, the more that I think that that shoulder's really banged up. He's just kind of confusing to watch as a player. He plays a lot faster out on the edge. Like they threw him the swing screen. Looks dynamic. Looks good. Looks sudden. Looks explosive. Then in the run game, when it looks like he's going to get some contact, looks very meh. Hmm. Can't make anyone miss. I I just don't understand it. It, it's like he's ready to get hit and he's like protecting himself or something. And he get, he's more worried about maybe protecting that shoulder than trying to be dynamic and make guys. I don't know, but it just does. It doesn't look the way it's supposed to look. Maybe that's the best way I can put it. Yeah. I don't know. It's hard to say. I, yeah, there's, I think, I think everyone, I think saw Chuck and Marcus major. I think, both guys had a couple of flashes, but we don't get the, you know, those flashes don't get them consistently like you're, like you're mentioning. And, you know, again, whenever you go back and watch last year and how Eric Gray would make the extra guy miss and turn it into something explosive is like, that's missing from our offense and it changes things drastically. No doubt. Now, Gavin Sawchuck. Shaky start, (laughs) strong finish. Him deciding whether or not to score was hilarious. Dude, there's over three minutes left in the game. They have all their timeouts, just score. But I appreciate him at least thinking about it and trying to have situational awareness. Like, that's that's good. Did did you hear anything afterwards? Did they talk about that beforehand? Because I saw Venables looking at him like this. And I don't know if that was like the, we just talked about this or if that's like, why aren't you just running into the end zone? I, I don't know what to make of that. I, I think it was a, why aren't you running into the end zone? <laughs> they have all their timeouts and there's a ton of time left on the clock. Right. But hey, you, you never know. But my hope is that this will give him confidence. This will be a launching point for some big plays moving forward because, and this is something we talked about on the broadcast as the game went on, it seemed like he started getting a better feel out there, right? A sense of the timing of the concepts, a sense of how to set up blocks. It it just, he's barely played. I know everyone remembers the Florida state game last year and how good he looked in that. Yeah. How good he looked in that game made people it made him seem like he'd been around for a long time. The guy has barely played. So I'm hoping that, you know, that, that third and especially that fourth quarter, right. That, that is, that's the start of something because this team desperately needs a big play guy at the running back position. And maybe Sacha can be that guy. Yeah. It looked like his, like he got far more patient 
letting things set up a little bit instead of kind of running into the back of it. Out now, I was curious. They went right down the field running the insert play. And I thought Stogner had a hell of a series, some really nice blocks. And then the next series, they didn't come back to it at all. Was Do you think that had something to do with Stogner coming off with the shoulder hurt? Like maybe they didn't want to run the insert stuff with him? I don't – because I don't know why they didn't go back to it with as much success as they had. Maybe they didn't get the looks. I don't know. Yeah, they ran it. They, they went with the inside zone in the split zone instead, which – you know, the, the concepts are not very different, right? Now you're targeting different guys, but pretty similar, just kind of variations of of what you want to do in your zone game. But I, you really can't complain much when you score on the split zone, right? Yeah. And it just opens up. And that's that's the play I'm going to break down for the in-the-weed stuff this week, kind of the, the dynamics of that play. But, yeah, I... This is what I'll say about some of the run game early in the game. I think they just got a little too, they had too much time to game plan with the bye week. <laughs> it's like they were in the lab going, oh, let's try this. Let's try that. Like the Gavin Freeman counter play. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Do I love that you run it on the last touchdown drive of the game in a huge moment? No. Don't need to dial that one up then. You know, but that's how it felt earlier. It was like, hey, we've we've been working on all this fun stuff. Let's see how UCF responds to it. And then it was it was not effective. Yeah. And when they kind of just got back to their core stuff late in the game in the fourth quarter, ran it really well. Yeah. Ran it efficiently. I thought guys were really physical. I just thought, yeah, that was uh it's kind of strange. I don't know. Yeah, I, and you know, I, I think it tells you probably what they think at like running back right now. Whenever they are lining Farouk up back there and trying to create some different stuff in the running game to to try and find some explosive plays in there. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I what was it about a month ago? I said I thought Farouk may be the best running back on the team. I didn't think they'd literally put him at running back. <laughs> now that was, that was, I think that that entire sequence was all to set up that shot play down the field, the follow wheel route. Yep. And it didn't work. UCF covered it. So, you know, sometimes you try to sequence plays, set something up, tip your hat to the defense, say good defense, yep. but it was a quiet day for Farouk. What three for 23, and he, he was working him there during that one that one little series though i thought they were they should have kept going back to him you know he's, yeah he he did some good things but also ucf like he did not create a ton of separation a lot of times and credit to ucs defense backs but drake stoops man it feels like the ball finds 12 in big moments huh I mean, touchdown to take the lead. A uh, couple of other huge catches on the next touchdown drive there in the fourth. I mean, what else can you say about the guy? When the team absolutely needs him, he delivered. I mean, just big plays and big moments. He was, Ted, he was huge in this game. That one where he comes back inside the Mike Backer, coming back to the ball to make that play over the middle. Just little nuanced things like that from him are are so awesome. And the jumps he's made from last year to this year on some of the stuff that he catches at the line of scrimmage and turns up field, uh, it felt like last year and in years past that he's he's going to do it, but he's going to get blown up, right? <laughs> but – now he's, you know, he's got way more strength to him, I feel like, and he's he's more physical, more sudden. He's had a great season. It's oh. we're going to miss him. I feel like whenever he's he's gone, just the that clutch gene, all those go-to catches that as he's getting hit, you know, pulling the ball away from defenders. There's a lot of really good stuff in what he does. And he was open early and DG just didn't see him. 
right? A lot of those drives where they they weren't able to create that separation that we talked about. Drake Stoops was open. Ball just didn't find him. Ball continues to find Nick Anderson, however. Yeah. Uh, another two touchdowns. And his catch to TD ratio took a hit. I know. I know. The horror. But well, he, had, he had five catches and two touchdowns, right? Yeah. And the ratio drops. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, he scored uh, that first one on the RPO, acting like he was blocking, right? Slipped it, wide open touchdown. I feel like we saw Andrew Anthony score on the exact same concept earlier in the season. Uh, second one, man, just ran right by the guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, another RPO where Dylan Gabriel decided, hey, I like that matchup up there. Just Great ran ball. right by him. Touchdown. And after the game, he said that corner was talking a little bit before that play, <laughs> which is uh, got to love when that happens. Uh, Jaden Gibson, a couple of big plays in the game. Drew the PI before the half, which was which was big, right? You end up getting points there. And then had a great catch on a third and 12 in the fourth quarter. Now, I don't think they went and got any points on the drive, but still for him to continue to make big plays and big moments like that, that is, that's important. And the, the go ahead touchdown, the Drake Stoops scored just an absolutely tremendous job by Jaden Gibson blocking his guy. Uh, he blocked his guy so long. The, the ref basically had to come and say, Hey man, he scored. You're good. He <laughs> was uh that, that was awesome. I love seeing plays like that from him. No, he's, he, he's another guy. I know we talk about Nick Anderson and his touchdown ratio. Well, Jaden Gibson, the ratio of having an impact whenever he's out there on the field is really good factor grade. I don't know if they do that on offense. They do it on defense, whether or not you're a factor in the play doesn't mean that you necessarily have the tackle or get the sack, but what you do on the play factors into the overall success of the play. And Jaden Gibson has a high factor grade. Yeah. All right, tight end, Austin Stogner, no bigger play in the game than him jumping on the onside kick. That was a great onside kick. It was good. That's a hard kick. I I don't know. I've heard it called the watermelon kick where they just sit it flat, and they kick it on the ground, and it spins like a top just into everyone's legs because the way that works is you've got some guys that are there to block and protect the hands guys, and the hands guys are obviously there to jump on the ball. And it's hard to block when there's this thing spinning around at your feet and you don't know where it is. So it's a it's a really good play, and they they pulled it off nicely. Uh, really nice block by Trace Ford on that. Had he not knocked his guy to the ground, then that, that dude was just going to fall right on the football. Yeah. Never should have come down to that, but hey, <laughs> way to go, Austin Stogner. Awesome job. And I thought he absolutely battled in the run game. Split zone. Zone insert, they ran some stuff where they ran, you know, one back power, but to the tight end, right, where he's right at the point of attack, did a nice job. He was huge in the last couple of drives as a blocker. And now the only complaint, probably he he catches that pass in the two-minute drill before the half, probably should have gone out of bounds Yeah, with that one, saved some time. We talked about how that, we talked about how that situation wasn't managed perfectly that's one of the reasons why you lost a lot of time right there but he has gotten better as a blocker right i know that i was pretty critical of him early on in the season but he continues to show small improvements right and even when the shoulder got banged up he showed a lot of toughness coming back out there and getting after guys i mean that was he put some good stuff on tape in this game, I, I, I was impressed, right? I agree. And he's, this is one thing you can say about Stogner. He doesn't turn it down, man. The yeah. technique may not always be great, but he's embracing the contact. Which, you know, is, it, it can be difficult in this day and age to play tight end whenever you're seeing some guys scoring a bunch of touchdowns and being a huge factor in the, in the past game. And essentially, you know, 90% of what he does is like a fullback work, right? Coming back on the split zone and going head to head with the defensive end or in the insert game, head to head with a with an inside backer. That is not easy duty. And to be able to do that on 
you know, 90% of your plays and the other 10% you're a factor in the pass game. Like that's not a fun ratio for a lot of guys. That's, that's going out and doing work for your team. I, I do think they need to sprinkle Blake Smith in a little bit. Stogner's just, he's played so many snaps. I mean, so many snaps and I get that that's the guy that you trust, but it's really hard to ask a guy to play the number of snaps he's playing. So Is, someone else in the tight end room, please, please help him out. Someone step up and earn some trust so that he's not just completely exhausted every football game. I don't know why we don't have a meathead. I, we need a meathead H back because let's face it. The tight end's not a huge part of our pass game. It's a, it's block. not, it's really not part it's of a, a pass game, a, a part of the pass game at all. It's a fullback. You're not, yeah. you don't gain anything in my opinion by having Stogner out there on a huge majority of the plays that you're in. Cause you're either going max pro or, you know, maybe he's running a flat route or something like that. Put a meathead in there that can go, you know, crush guys for 20 snaps a game at least. Take some of the pressure off of them. I'm with you. Offensive line. And I mean meathead in a good way. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> of course. Offensive line, uh, not good enough, right, in the run game. Not creating enough movement in the run game. I don't know how many times I'm going to have to say it. I've said it a lot this season. That's what I saw again. Now, when you go through the individual guys, also, what, one random observation, it seems like their splits were bigger in this game. Hmm. Like, there's a couple of situations where I'm looking at splits going, man, this looks like Texas Tech back in the day. Like, we're talking five-foot splits, which I, I don't know if that was part of the game plan, if they – thought they'd created an advantage I, maybe it was just I, I don't know what it was it was just interesting but Walter Rouse what other than a false start I thought he played really really well now is he a guy that completely dominates out there and goes and buries guys into the ground no but he does his job at a pretty dang high level he's consistent he was good in pass pro solid in the run game another nice performance from Rouse, Caden Green, he he played like a true freshman. Some really good things, some bad things. When he got beaten in pass protection, it had a lot to do with his feet being overly active. And it forced him to drift either too far inside, too far outside on his sets. Sometimes it feels like if there's space, you you just like start backing up for some reason naturally. You're like, uh, closing the space is a good thing. You get to your point in your set. The, the defender has to come to you. Calm down. You're good. You're not doing anything wrong because he's, he's far away. You're not doing anything wrong. Backing up or continuing to float inside or outside. That's, it's not going to set you up for success. Get to where you're supposed to get and your point you're set and settle your feet and calm down. He is, he's capable. Just calm the lower body down and he's going to be just fine. Right? I thought he got better. Right? I thought he got better and that's important. It's kind of and one he of those... battles. That's the thing. The physicality is there, which when you talk about a freshman offensive lineman, it's like, okay, does this guy have the physicality to play? And he absolutely does. Yeah. Is it is it kind of one of those things where kind of know where the hoop is? Like yes. Where the, where you're protecting where the quarterback is, not necessarily so you there's no reason to go float out to a guy whenever he's got to come to you to get to the get to the basket so to speak. Sometimes with young offensive linemen, with inexperienced offensive linemen, your mind is reflected in your feet. Yeah. And if everything's happening real, real fast upstairs, you're seeing a lot of a lot of pitter patter with the feet. A lot going on. Yeah. It'll all slow down for him the more comfortable he gets out there in games. And that takes reps. There's no simulating being out there. 
right? Yeah. There is no simulating. Hey, we're down to UCF in the fourth quarter, and we got to go put the damn touchdown drive together, or else we're going to lose. Yeah. Can't create that on the practice field. So he, he'll get better. I, I'm confident he'll get better. He's showing. I thought he he showed what he needed to show, and he and he got to play the entire football game. I mean, there's so much value in that. Was there some bad? Absolutely. Beanbow going to rip him a lot? <laughs> no doubt about it. But it's just the experience being out there, it's huge for him. Andrew Rain thought he played with good physicality. Uh, I thought that they targeted things well uh, in the run game and pass protection, right? That all starts with him. I, I do not understand some of the technique that he's using in some of the zone running game. He's high-legging when he's working to a, a front-side defensive lineman, to a front-side backer. I don't understand. It's clearly what he's being coached. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I, I don't think it sets him up to create movement in the run game, but he's doing what he's coached, whatever. Makes no sense to me. But other than that, he got beat on a couple things. But, yeah, I thought that he, he – he's – played the way that I've kind of come to expect him to way to play wasn't wasn't tremendous but also was was consistent and did a nice job for the most part there's just not enough movement in the interior of the run game and I I'm starting to think it's more of a technique thing than anything because he's he's got some pretty good explosiveness he can move I I don't know I don't understand it I don't I, I've talked about this a lot though so People are probably just going, oh, here he goes again, talking about the zone stuff. But Better game just, snapping the ball? Yeah. No snap issues, right? Well, I, I mean, the one that went through Sawchuck's hands, but that hit him right in the hands. Was it hot? Sure. Catch the ball, man. Yeah. But uh, Savion Bird and Caleb Schaefer at the right guard position. I'll start with Schaefer. Got the start, did some nice stuff in the first half. Uh, got banged up on the drive before the half. I'm not entirely sure what it was. Ankle, maybe? And did not look very good after that. Right, Went out there early in the third quarter, did not look good, uh, and got replaced by Savion Bird. But saw some good things from Schaefer. When he, when he gets guys, man, he gets them. Now, he swings and misses a little bit. He doesn't have great, great quickness when it comes to redirection, but you know, when, he's fun to watch if he gets guys. Uh, Savion Bird. I thought he played well, right? And now, he had one play that almost almost made me lose my mind on the broadcast. <laughs> I think I didn't speak for about 10 minutes as a result of it. Double mug look, two A-gap backers, just no awareness, gets picked, ends up giving up a sack. Bill pulled him because of it. But I thought he was playing well before that. And at some point, you just got to let this guy work through some mistakes, in my opinion. I mean, he played snaps 9 through 23, gives up the sack. We didn't see him until snap 60. He's a better player than Caleb Schaefer, in my opinion. Was he dominant? No. Was he as physical as I want him to be? No. Does he need to come off more in the run game? Absolutely. But he did some good things. And he needs confidence. I Ted, I never do this. But he got pulled because of the sack. I saw him on the sideline. I saw the look in his eyes. And I grabbed him. I said, man, you can do it. Play with confidence. Like, you can do it. Believe in yourself. You can do it. And I don't know if that helped him or not. I, I don't know. But he just, he gets so down on himself. Like, I'm I'm not a body language expert, but I know what that looked like. And if that guy can just get some confidence back, he can do some really good stuff. Like, he's a physically gifted player. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what that right guard spot looks like moving forward. Uh, moving forward. I don't know if Matoyer is going to be ready for the Kansas game. In a perfect world, you don't have to put him out there. Right, that was a that was a bad ankle injury, but 
we'll, we'll yeah, see. What's he? We'll we'll see where Schaefer's at health wise. But it, it may be Savion see, Bird. See uh, Metallier jog out there for the that field goal. I, someone else, <laughs> go out there. Anyone else? Uh, anyone but the guy that's got the bum ankle. Now, hey, I'll give Metoyer some credit. That dude's tough. Yeah, it's a tough dude. So that that, but yes, I was going really. We can't. None of you other slappies can run out there for one snap of field goal. Come on now. Now, last thing, Tyler Guyton. I have extremely high standards for him, and I continue to think he's too measured in the run game. Uh, when he comes off the ball. And doesn't think too much, man, it's good. But he just had some plays where there's just too much hesitation. And pass protection, this is where he's getting in trouble. And it was was solid, but remember, I'm expecting elite play from this guy. Like first round type of play. He is not using his length at all. He, there is no violence with his hands. He's got these ridiculously long God-given arms and he doesn't use them. No striking, no violence with his hands. Two hands, one hand. It's way too catch-oriented. He needs to strike people. He's retreating too much in his sets. Similar to what I said about Caden Green. right? Guyton gets to a point If you get to that spot, if you get to where you want to be in your set, settle your feet. Don't back up. Don't keep backing up. There's no reason. Nothing good comes from that. I mean, you're just helping the defensive end out. Make him come to you. But he's what what a lot of teams in the country want this guy with the way that he's playing. (laughs) Absolutely. But I just, I know there's more from him. He is he is capable of more than what he's showing right now, which is, you know, it's frustrating, but it's also exciting in a weird way. Where it's like, dude, you can be so much better. Uh, just a few small things, but the the violence needs to ramp up. Yeah. Thank you for coming to my offensive line TED talk. <laughs> that was a lot of O line. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, no, guys. I, I apologize. I think it's all good stuff. All good stuff. Call your shot. We asked you guys, number one takeaway from OU's win against UCF, uh, Terry R. Nichols chimes in and says, the kicker needs our support, not criticism. (laughs) It's a pressure position and is mental. Let's help get the kid right. Look at Terry with the... uh, that's a take, man. And I kind I kind of agree. Clearly, Zach Schmidt's the best guy they've got, or else we would have seen someone else by now. Yeah. But the way that he's struggled. Yeah, let's rally around him. Let's try it. The power of positivity, Ted. Power of positivity. I'm there. Uh yeah, there's there's times where we have what we have. He's clearly got all the leg in the world. You know, he whenever he hits it, he hits it. Um yeah, I I get that. Let's let's get behind him. Let's have some positivity. Let's uh bring that mindset up and see where we go. Yeah. We got a lot of responses. There's too many to just pick one. A lot of that's not a game we win last season. At what point do we stop saying that? Can we move on? It can we move on from that? Yeah. I don't care about last season anymore. I, I think we all know what's on the table now. Big 12 championship, college football playoff, that's all on the table. Very reasonable expectation. So do we need to keep up, keep bringing up how bad the football team was a year ago? Like, I don't, Does that make people feel better? It doesn't make me feel any better. Well, I, I think it's a, it, I think it's better than the alternative of just uh, like last year of, of 
you know, just being incredibly negative. And I, I think we, we all know that it, it's, it's saying the same thing as, um, we should play better. You know, there's no reason that team should stick around with us and, and have a chance late, I think is the same. You're saying the exact same thing negatively there as you are positively whenever you say that's a game we lose last year. So I think everyone's kind of saying the same thing, right? Okay. It's just a little better positive spin on it. I like it. I'm all for the positivity. 7-0. and I ain't going to be mad, okay? 7-0. and All right, let's recap some of the other great games in week eight of college football. But first... John Vance Auto Group has a deal for Oklahoma Breakdown listeners. Go to any of their nine full-service dealerships in Woodwork, Miami, and Guthrie and tell them we sent you, and they'll give you $500 off. That's 500 bucks off just because you listen to this podcast. They've been serving Oklahomans for 40 years, family-owned and operated, and no matter what your vehicle needs are, John Vance Auto Group has you covered. They carry domestic brands such as Ford, Lincoln, Chevy, Buick, GMC, Chrysler, Dodge, Ram, Jeep, and Wagoneer. John Vance Auto Group's goal is to give unequaled service and to exceed customers' expectations in every way. Where they, uh, you can find all their information about their lifetime loyalty program, browse their entire inventory, and find the John Vance dealership near you at vanceautogroup.com. And attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter-toasted buns, and ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game. And with all the garage locations being open at 10 p.m. or later every night, it's the go-to late-night spot. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Week 8 of college football. Well, a, uh, a James Franklin-led Penn State team has still not beaten Ohio State in Columbus. Mm, mm, mm. Buckeyes win 20-12. to 12, And I can only imagine, because you're a sicko, defensive sicko, I can only imagine how much you love this football game. Man, this, this was your type of game. Both defenses were, I mean, both defenses were really impressive. Neither team could run the football at all. Maybe both offenses were bad also. I don't know. But this was a game that was dominated by the defenses. There's a very fine line between good defense and bad offense. Sometimes you just don't know where the line is. Maybe it was a little bit of both in this one. Yeah. But I, I don't know if there's a deep X's and O's complex complex breakdown needed for this one one team had marvin harrison jr the other team did not here's the difference in the game right well 11 for 162 in a touchdown i mean he was the reason that ohio state won the game in my opinion they had him penn state didn't and when we previewed this game earlier in the week we talked about the importance of Drew Aller having to make some big time throws in this one. That that did not happen. 18 of 42 for 191, and in some crucial situations, he didn't deliver. Penn State was one of 16. You heard me correctly. One of 16 Woo. on third down. Now, to Aller's credit, I didn't see a lot of Penn State wide receivers creating separation. Right. So credit to Ohio State's defensive backs. That defense looks great. But yeah. they needed Aller to deliver, right, to make some big time, thro big time throws in this one. And he, he was not up to the task. Yeah. And that's the thing, right, with Penn State, it feels like 
in order to win one of these type of games against Ohio State or Michigan, they're, they have to have the best player on the field. And it just doesn't feel like they've ever had that in this game, either one of these games. I guess recently with uh, with Michigan, but for quite a while now with Ohio State, they're just missing that explosive guy that when the coverage is tight and when the defense is good can still either make a guy miss consistently or get out of trouble or make the big catch. They just, Ohio State always has that guy and Penn State doesn't. And Penn State, right on the road in Columbus, they needed, they needed a special play and they got it. Sack, strip, fumble, scoop and score. Called back for defensive holding in the second quarter. Ted, I'm going to give you one guess. Who was def- Who was Penn State's defense holding? Uh, Marvin Harrison Jr. Correct. Ah, figured. And they and Ohio State ends up. They go and punch that in. It would have been ten three Penn State on the scoop and score. Instead, ten three Ohio State. Oof. I mean, you talk about having a massive impact on a game. Back Marvin Harrison grade. Jr. was the difference in the game. And this is really the last thing I have on this game. Gus Johnson, for the love of God, please stop trying to make Maserati Marva thing. Oh, what was that? <laughs> I didn't know. It's like he was getting paid every time he said Maserati Marv. And I, I was like, am I the only one that is that thinks this is just absurd? And then I searched Maserati Marv on Twitter. It appears everyone agrees with me. Stop it. I love Gus Johnson. I love the energy he brings to a broadcast. I think he does a tremendous job. But don't try to force Maserati Marv on us. Don't try to make fetch thing a Gus. Come on. Run that through a focus group first. Is that what you're saying? To see if it's see if it's the right way to go. It was over and over. And it, the funny part was Clat said it once or twice early in the game, and then he was like, "I'm out, man." <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was pretty well, funny. Maybe this will get me hammered in the uh, in the comment sections, but I think Maserati's like the most overrated vehicle there is. Thank you. They're first cheap. of all. Marvin Harrison Jr., no disrespect to anyone that's got a Maserati out there. I, I understand there is a very large price tag that comes with that car. But Marvin Harrison Jr., Maserati Marv, is going to be way richer than that. Yeah. He's going to be Rolls Royce Marv or Bugatti Marv. That's right. In the world of exotic cars, like, you're essentially calling him Kia, in my opinion, you know? Yes. And you're a car guy. I'm not a car guy, <laughs> but this is how I will frame it. I love Charlie Whitehurst. He's one of my favorite NFL teammates. Clipboard Jesus drove a Maserati. Awesome car. But you got into the player parking lot, the guys that were making the huge money, Lamborghinis, Ferraris, Rolls Royce, it's not Maserati. That's right. It's almost it's almost a disrespectful nickname <laughs> for Marvin Harrison Jr. <laughs> it's undervaluing him. I know uh, it sounds crazy, but it I is. That, that was my first thought whenever, because I didn't hear, I just saw the highlights of the game, so I didn't hear that. Uh, whenever I saw that you had that on there, I was like, eh, I don't that's I don't think that's the compliment that he thinks it is, at least not in my opinion. Some people may love Maserati. Moving on to the next game. Tennessee at Alabama. Wow. Tale of two halves, right? Yep. I mean, Tennessee controlled the first half of this football game. They end up losing 34 to 20 to Alabama. Tennessee was up 20 to 7 at the half. And Honestly, I thought they missed a big opportunity to create some serious separation early in this football game. Uh, they had the, the the big big touchdown drive to open the game, but settled for some field goals. And there was that window was there where Tennessee's defense was playing really, really well. B 
Bama's defense was kind of on their heels a little bit, and they just weren't able to create the separation that they needed in that sequence. And then the Bama defense came to play in that second half. Oh, boy. Yeah. I mean, completely, completely shut Tennessee down. Other than a few Joe Milton runs, the the Vols couldn't do much of anything in the second half of that game. Yeah. Yep, they had him had him locked down, and he was having to throw the ball away a lot. You know, something I noticed in that game, and I know Alabama's offensive line gets a ton of heat, and a lot of it is rightfully so, but I think um, Milrow just doesn't have hardly any feel in the pocket. He doesn't help himself up much at all. He doesn't step up whenever they're running the hoop. Around the outside, he doesn't step up. He stays deep in the pocket, just like he doesn't have much feel in there, if that makes sense. There is an epidemic in college football of quarterbacks dropping to like 10 yards deep and staying there. Yeah. Drop deep, get the defensive ends to go wide and fast, and then step up. You're supposed to get the back of your drop and then step up, right? Correct. There's a lot of get deep and stay deep. Yeah. Not a recipe for success. Now, looking at the big plays in this game, no bigger play than the stat, sack strip, fumble, scoop, and score, right? In the fourth. I mean, that was the biggest play of the game. I, I guess you would say Bama's offense did enough. Uh, I thought the uh, I thought the bomb to Isaiah Bond out of the half for the touchdown, I thought that was a really big play in the game. Got some nope. momentum going. When he lets it go, he's got a drill bit for a deep ball, man. He throws a beautiful deep ball. Speaking of epidemics in college football, Tennessee. Ted, I think it's safe to say Joe Milton is a large human being at the quarterback position, right? I'd say so. Fourth and inches from your own 34. And you're in the shotgun and you run QB counter. And it almost kind of looked the way that the tight end acted it almost looked like maybe it should have been a shovel pass. I don't know what was going on there. There, I it was strange. Was this from QB sneak? Was it that old two, uh, two point play a couple of years ago that everyone was running? Was it the Chiefs that started that? Yeah, I, I can't decide if it was just QB counter or there was more to it. But I, the tight end looked confused coming back around as the second puller if it was supposed to be counter. I mean, it was. It was not well executed. Joe Milton is huge. It's fourth and inches. I got no problem going for it. Run QB sneak. Get under center and push your giant quarterback from behind. They did it later in the game, fourth and one. I think it was from like right around midfield. In the gun. Hand it off. Run QB sneak. Your quarterback is huge. Work on it and practice and run it. Please. Yeah. Well, it's it, – Coach Stoops said the same thing, you know, in the first quarter of our broadcast when he, he came on and we had the football. Yeah, I, I I have to imagine you don't see it because college quarterbacks are almost never under center. Is that the reason that you don't feel comfortable doing it on a fourth and one? Like – you're under center zero times the entire game. It's hard to get under there and do it under pressure on fourth down when you've got all the – I mean, is that the reasoning why they don't? Here's how I'll frame it for you. Each and every week, you carry some special game plan play, plays, right, for a game, right? You want to call them tricks, gadgets, whatever. If you can prepare that stuff, you can prepare snapping the ball under center and going forward. It ain't that hard. I agree. And it may, their inability to run that play may have cost them the football game. If you can run QB sneak, maybe you walk out of Tuscaloosa with a win. I assure you, he can learn to take a snap under center, and the center can figure it out. Practice it. It's only been done for 100-plus years, right? It's insane. 
all across the country, fourth and inches, guys in the shotgun. I just, especially a guy Milton's size, just have him take the snap and push him from behind. You're going to get the first down. Yeah, they even changed the rule. You can aid the runner now. You can push the runner. That play is it's no longer QB sneak. It's QB shove. You would call it the tush push, whatever you want to call it. You can literally just create a mass of humanity. And if you got a huge quarterback, I just I've I've complained enough. Anything <laughs> you got anything else from that game? Hey, this just in Bama wins a lot of football games. They're getting there quietly. They're getting there quietly. Uh, last game, we called this one a culture game. Utah at USC, and you nailed it, Ted. Utah wins again. Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, that was a wild football game. It's, you know, you, you still kind of see some of the same things with, with USC. It's can, can Caleb Williams dig him out of the hole, right? That's they go as he goes. If he can make some plays, if he can hit some, some throws, if he can scramble around behind the line and, uh, you know, buy time for guys down the field, he's going to beat you. If he can't do that, they're not going to win. And it's just, uh, really a gutsy performance by Utah coming up with the plays they needed to. And, uh, you know, backup quarterback wise, he took a huge shot, I guess, delivered a huge shot in that game. And he looked like he was out on his feet for a couple of plays, but comes back and, and makes it like the most critical play after that. That was a gutsy effort. Yeah. And, and you think about it, you think about critical situations in that game. Fourth and one from the 42, game on the line, Utah converts. And then Bryson Barnes, massive play with his legs to set up the walk-off field goal. Utah was, it It started to feel like they were going to blow him out. Yeah, it did. When they were and up, what, then, but the 14? pick six, the pick six early in the fourth quarter made this one. I mean, it was really fun to watch down the stretch. Yeah had the weird play where the ball Caleb Williams is throwing the quick quick out and ball just came out of his hands and Lincoln Riley chose to kick the kick the field goal trust his defense and they got the stop Zachariah Branch continues to be electric I mean the punt return to set up the touchdown the the QB draw touchdown for Caleb Williams that was pretty awesome yeah he's Every time he touches the football, he's got a chance to go to the house. It's that's he is a he's a wild player. That's one of those rare guys that comes around every, you know, seven, eight years and just crazy. I don't know how he's I mean, obviously he's got great speed, but his it's like vision and creativity on a play that you just don't see every day. It's it's impressive to watch. I as as fun as that guy is, watching Jaquin and Jackson and Sione Faki, these guys were awesome. Yeah. I mean, I think I'm saying that right. Faki? 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 I think it's Faki. He, he had one of the most impressive pass-catching performances for a running back that I can remember. The guy plays both ways. Like, I don't even know if he's a running back. I guess he was a receiver in high school, and it looked like he was because, I mean, wheel routes out of the backfield, catching the ball down the sideline, angle routes, routing dudes up, catching it, changing direction. Five for 149 and two touchdowns out of the backfield. That'll work. A couple of those throws on those wheel routes were just money, too. No doubt. Like, just like, boom, right there. That was that was cool to watch. and um. Baki is he's a it's it's weird he looks like really upright whenever he runs he's got the ball in his hands but just great vision and finds the perfect way to snake between some of those blocks out on the perimeter and good job by Utah down the field blocking 
on some of those longer runs and 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 stuff. So that's pretty impressive performance. He's a damn football player is what he is. Yeah. And they did. I thought Utah had some really tough stuff against USC's defense when it came to the QB run game. Wildcat, uh, Bryson Barnes, turns out he can run a little bit. Yeah. But they had some stuff where Jackson and Vaki were in the backfield together. Right, Jackson's taking the snap. Vaki's at running back. Just some creative stuff. Mm-hmm. That is not easy to defend, but. You look at USC situation now. Uh, Pac-12 hopes are likely done. Obviously, national title, college football playoff, like that's off the table with two losses. Caleb Williams cannot win the Heisman Trophy. Any chance we uh, we get to about Wednesday and we start we start hearing about some hamstring tightness there for the starting quarterback? One hundred percent. That's right. The the nagging soft tissue injuries are, are going to start to pop up. and Maybe a calf. Yeah, that's right. And, you know, I we talked about this before. There's, with a lot of attention, with, a, a, with a, a big spotlight, comes a lot of scrutiny. And you got a lot of people right now that are trying to pull that team apart. And this is this is where you figure out, like, does that piece together transfer portal mentality of, you know, just pulling guys in, can, can that stay together? Can it stay tight whenever, you know, there's a bunch of people are going to be trying to wedge that team apart. People are going to start telling Caleb Williams, you need to protect yourself. Telling some of the other guys that maybe think about going to the NFL, you need to have your best interest in mind instead of, a culture team, a Utah team, it's about the group. It's the collective. We do it for one another. Like there, that that battle's gonna be going on with USC and I don't know what's gonna happen. Yeah, we'll see. Uh only last thing on this game, just one of the quotes of the year from Kyle Whittingham afterwards. We've got ourselves a pig farmer at quarterback, so we're proud of that guy too. Just I don't even know what to do with that. Just incredible stuff. Is that a compliment? I No, I think – I don't know anything about Bryson Barnes' background, but he was talking about Caleb Williams and being complimentary of him, like, hey, they got a Heisman Trophy winner. I think at some point in his life, Bryson Barnes was a pig farmer. Okay. That's what I think is going on here. I don't think it's – I I think he meant it literally. Okay. Or at I least always, that's how I interpreted it. I always – Think of the uh, what's the quote in Snatch? Uh, Brick top. What's he say? Never trust a pig farmer or something <laughs> like that. I haven't <laughs> seen that movie in forever. Uh, that's. Need to go watch that again. That's, All right, let's finish I up like that quote though. Yeah, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, do you have difficulty sitting for long periods of time or can't lay on your side due to pain? Well, it's a hip thing, and the only person to go see is Dr. Brandon Johnson at the Hip Clinic in Oklahoma City. No matter your age, the Hip Clinic has the experience and knowledge to help ease your hip pain and preserve your hip joint. Don't let the pain hold you back any longer. Don't just accept a hip replacement. Call the Hip Clinic today at 844-KEEP-HIP or visit thehipclinicokc.com. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School represents a tradition of educational excellence in Oklahoma City. Grounded in a faith-based education, Bishop McGinnis offers a college prep curriculum that includes 22 AP courses, participation in OSSAA athletics, and numerous clubs and organizations for students to join and grow. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. Financial aid is available. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? Oklahoma State Cowboys with the big win over West Virginia. That's a that's a nice win. And you mentioned this with Ohio State. One team had Marvin Harrison Jr., one did not. That was the difference in the football game. Well, one team had Ollie Gordon, the other did not. That was the difference in the football game. This dude is on an absolute heater right now. Every time he touches the ball, 
just incredible stuff. What do you average? It was almost 11 yards a carry. 29 carries for 282 yards and four touchdowns. Four. Dude is an absolute beast running the football. And I'll say this. He is doing it behind a bad offensive line. <laughs> you you are not going to change my opinion of that group. It's not a good group. Which makes what Ollie Gordon is doing. I sit there and watch. And I go, my goodness, this guy. He's huge. He's running through people. He's showing speed. That was a massive win. Massive. For them. Yeah. They are, they're right there in the conversation. Right? You talk about the third best team in the Big 12 right now. They are right there in the conversation with Iowa State. Now, you probably have to give Iowa State the the edge because Iowa State beat Oklahoma State. But it feels like Oklahoma State's found found the recipe and it's give the damn ball to Ollie Gordon. That's right. That's right. Don't overthink it, right? Uh we've got here's the best player we've got on our football team. Let's hand it to him 30 times a game. Um yeah, he is he's incredible and he's he's taken them to another level and been saying it a while that game in Stillwater is going to be a fight it's going to be a, a tough game for us to go win there's going to be a lot of uh energy in that place so it's fun man I I continue to credit Mike Gundy I I said it before the season this year I have no reason to believe that Oklahoma State is going to have a good football team I have no reason to believe they're going to be able to put anything together offensively. There is nothing I can point at to say that I think Oklahoma State has a chance to compete for a Big 12 championship, but I know somehow, some way, they're going to be there. These are the years whenever Mike Gundy usually shows up with something good is whenever no one no one picks him to, to compete. It's He is an impressive football coach. He's he's very good. And you just think a little over a month ago, what South Alabama did to him on their own field. Now they're a five and two football team, and they are right in the middle of a of a race for one of the spots in the Big 12 title game. What's funny is thinking back to that game, they got hammered at home and post game Mike Gundy's like well you know I don't think we have that big of issues anywhere everyone's like what he he said no major issues yeah I don't see any major we don't have any majors that's what he said (laughs) and hey turns out the guy may know a thing or two (laughs) my goodness hell of a win though man Uh, hell of a win five and two you know Oklahoma State Cowboys are five and two Impressive. Anything else on them? Nope. That was a that was a that was a good one. Ollie Gordon, he's he's going to start being talked about quite a bit nationally with the run he's on. No doubt. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? Well, I, everyone coming out of this game is a loser. The Texas Houston football game. Oh my uh, gosh. Texas loses Quinn Ewers. Not exactly sure. Like what the prognosis is on that um but they find their way out of that football game but they shouldn't have i don't know what happened down the stretch with with houston i don't know why dana holgerson didn't call a timeout to have that spot challenged don't let them say oh we looked at it there's nothing there that that should have been stopped and reviewed the review rules in college football state that anytime that there's something questionable that has a direct impact on the outcome of a football game in a critical moment, it should be reviewed. And that was not, he should have challenged it. He should have thrown a, or not thrown a, uh, called a timeout. They need that play needed to be reviewed. It looked to me, clearly a bad spot at a minimum it's like fourth and 
inches, but most likely that looked like a first down to me. I I think it was absolutely a first down. And Holgerson talked about it after the game. You're going to love this quote. We took the mighty Texas Longhorns, the number eight team in the country, to the wire. I think the spot was horrible. I think we got the first down. It was first and nine at the nine. I don't understand review. Every time I think something is reviewable, I can't get them to review it. They say they're looking at it, but I don't know that. There's no He's way right. they're looking at it. Right. Well, that's why, in my opinion, he had one timeout. You don't want to, but you've got to use a timeout right there. you got to challenge. And I don't know, did he challenge earlier in the game? It's in. It's under two minutes, right? It should be reviewed. Yes. Yes. 100%. That play should have been reviewed. And it was a first down. That was an was awful a, spot. I, hey, I credit Tim Brando on the call was like, that's first down. I don't know what they're looking at. <laughs> it's pretty funny. It was, I, I also, so you don't, you get the horrible spot. You get that bad break, right? Oh, six, fourth six and inches. Quarterback. <laughs> fourth and inches. Your quarterback's enormous. Donovan Smith is huge. You run sprint pass. Yep. Just get under center. Now, Texas has some beef in the interior of the defensive line, right? Uh, I will acknowledge that. But still, man, you've got this huge, massive athlete at quarterback. Just let him fall forward for the first down. Yep. The sprint pass was there. It was just ball was late. Horrible throw from Smith. Yeah. I mean, it was there. It was open. I you could see we, Holgerson's frustration on the sideline. My goodness. We were all uh, Holgerson at that point, I think, uh, on our knees, pounding the ground. <laughs> I understand the frustration. I mean, I, I, I understand it. I, I feel bad for Houston battling like that, and you feel like a call – is is the and do they do they go score we ne we'll never know but you hate to see that that had such a huge impact on the game i don't know what the what the issue is with quinn ewers though like what are they saying on that is shoulder remember that he missed a lot of time last year yeah i i don't know if it's ac joint if it's collarbone i think he's gonna miss some time again and all of a sudden you start taking a look at that texas schedule it's gonna be tough Three November 4th, four. Kansas State comes to Austin. And we'll get to it. You want to take a guess of who my winner of the weekend is? <laughs> is? Is the old saying, you don't have one quarterback if you have two? Is that Has that been proven incorrect? They made it look pretty damn good. <laughs> Let's get to my winner and loser. But first... Elevate your tailgate with Chapel Supply and Equipment in Oklahoma City. Chapel Supply and Equipment has generators and inverters on hand that'll give you all the power you need so you could take your tailgate to the next level. They've also got top-of-the-line heaters to keep you warm during those cold tailgates later in the season. They're Oklahoma-owned and operated. Elevate your tailgate by calling 405-495-1722 or visit chapelsupply.com. That's C-H-A-P-P-E-L-L -L supply.com. First Fidelity Bank knows how to keep fans like you happy with more than 50 awards in the last five years, including Forbes Best In-State Bank, the Oklahoma's Community Choice Awards, and the Journal Records Reading Rankings. It's clear that they're Oklahoma's number one pick for quality banking. And you can find that level of outstanding service in everything FFB offers. Open an account at an award-winning bank today at ffb.com. First Fidelity Bank, we go where you go. Don't forget to head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And obviously, grow, grab the Stutzman shirt, but also, and Drake Stoops has to do a better job of promoting himself. He's got three shirts. They're for Opolis, and they're all awesome. His entire family was rocking them at the game. I was wondering if that's what his mom was wearing. Yes. Everyone was, was like, cool Where, shirt. Carol, where'd you get that shirt? It's at opolisclothing.com. I know how much the fan base loves Drake Stoops. Go support that young man. The shirts are cool, too. 
how awesome was the uh the free marketing from the the flight crew with the Texas Sucks Opolis t-shirt? That that that's one of the cooler things that's happened for us as a podcast. That was cool. When he opened that and I saw the shirt, I was like, oh, that's Teddy. That's our shirt. <laughs> that was awesome. I don't know who you are, sir, but thank you for your service. And that was awesome. I think I could lip read. I think he was saying promo code Ted, T E D. Oh, that was good. All right. For my winner of the weekend, the Kansas State Wildcats. Woo. The question going into this game against TCU How would a two back? Two quarterback system work with Will Howard and Avery Johnson. Would it work? I believe the answer to that is a resounding yes. They made it work. But is it a two quarterback system, though, really? Isn't it one quarterback and one tight end? Wow. You went there. <laughs> Will Howard was awesome at this game, too. I know it. I he know played it. like a guy that does not want to lose his job to a freshman. Right. And K State destroyed TCU 41 to three in Manhattan. That offense was humming early. Touchdown, 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 field goal. It's how the OU game should have been. Yep. But both quarterbacks, Avery Johnson and Will Howard, were rock solid, threw it well, made good decisions with the football. Avery Johnson added a lot to the run game. They ran him quite a bit. Will Howard. Ripped off some big explosive runs. And I, I thought they both played well. And this was a bludgeoning. <laughs> that Kansas State offensive line punished TCU's defense. They ran for a cool 343 yards in this one. Man. Ted, this thing was a bloodbath, dude. Yeah. And all of a sudden, you're looking at K State, and I'll tell you this: you know, I'm not, I'm not scared of for Oklahoma to play anyone in the Big Twelve Conference. Don't hate that OU doesn't have to play this K State team, though. Yeah, it's crazy in the regular season. Yeah, it's crazy whenever you look at the the stats in this game. They they ran for three forty three, and didn't have a hundred yard rusher. I, your instant thinking is, well, they don't have like one really good guy, but it's, it's more difficult whenever you've got all kinds of different guys that they do different things with, and they all have a lot of success. Um, well, Ward we'll Giddens at running back are both, they're good in the run game. They catch the ball out of the backfield. Well, now you've right. got Avery Johnson and his speed at quarterback. A lot of moving parts, a lot of shifts, a lot of motions, like they've always had. It's yeah. tough, man. Yeah, they're they're two leading rushers. Uh, you mentioned Warden Gins. They they both caught touchdown passes too. You know, yeah. and had several several catches out there. It's a it's led by that offensive line, and it is it is a difficult difficult animal to deal with. Whenever they get rolling and they get momentum, it's just like a steamroller. You can't stop it. I've got a got a question for you. Okay. As a defensive guy, what do you consider an explosive play on offense? Is it runs of 12, 15, passes of 15, 20? Like, what are your Everyone's benchmarks there? a little there? bit different, and I think it's changed over the years. I think an explosive run is, I think, a run of 18 yards. Oh, okay. Wow. Okay. It, it may be – it may be – shorter than that now what, I'm what do you exactly... what do you think for explosive pass then uh i think it's if i i feel like run is 18 and a pass is like 24 but i think okay. that may be wrong I, i'm not sure I'll have if, to look it up. using those benchmarks and i went i watched a ton of this game i think using those benchmarks tcu had one explosive play in the game amani bailey had like a 30 plus yard run I think their longest pass play was 16 yards to, I think, it, I believe it was Savion Williams. So you talk about ex explosive plays as an offense. You think about that group a year ago for TCU, and I know they lost some dudes, okay? Mm -hmm. One explosive play in the entire football game? I mean, you, 
and you're you're playing a freshman quarterback, right? And I talked to Josh Hoover on my Sirius XM show earlier this week. Super likable guy, right? Was excited for the opportunity, but that's not an easy place for a freshman to go play. And they fell in such a big hole early. They just that's, could not get anything going offensively at all. That's what I'm talking about whenever I say that it matters whenever you score early because, like TCU, you've got a freshman quarterback there. When you get up and you punch it in early and you can you can change your thinking offensively to more of a uh, we're going to grind this thing out, possess it, in TCU, you have to get increasingly more risky and put more on. Like they would much rather play in a tight football game where they can lean on the run. But now, because of what happened with the score early, they have to put it on a young quarterback's arm. It's not what you want. Defensively, it makes playing defense way easier. Yeah. Now you look at the picture in the Big 12 Conference standings, OU in a great spot, right? Four and a, Four teams now sitting at three and one. Now, K-State's got the loss to Oklahoma State already, but they still have Texas and Austin on November 4th and Iowa State in Manhattan on November 25th on the schedule. I think we both predicted K-State to play in the Big 12 championship game this season and with the way that team is looking i think they got a pretty good chance yeah so it's gonna be fun gonna be fun uh the big the the big 12 down the stretch is gonna be a lot of fun it is and i i know uh and i told i told coach venables the other night at the at rudy's i was like um, someone had mentioned something about Texas and we were just talking over the break and I was like, I don't think you guys see him again. And he's like, what do you mean? Who you think you think? I, like, I basically would just pointed out that they're going to lose to Kansas state and Kansas state's going to be the team late. And which was, you know, I, I didn't know they were going to do this to TCU and, it just it starts to feel that way that I don't know that Texas, when you watch that Houston game and now Quinn Ewers. Yeah. I don't I know a lot of people had just assumed that it's gonna be a rematch. And I we have work to do ourselves to get there, okay? I like we've got our own things we need to deal with. But just looking across the rest of the conference, I mean, I it's still wide open, but K State's looking good. And I think Iowa State, Oklahoma State are looking good too. Yeah. There's a reason there's a saying about assuming. That That's right. It exists for a reason. All right, for my loser of the weekend, the North Carolina Tar Heels. Wow. What a disaster for Mac Brown's group. Uh, for those that didn't tune into the CW for this one, number 10 North Carolina loses to Virginia. Virginia came into this game one and five. Tar Heels got beat on their own field by a team that came in one and five. Now, all credit to Tony Elliott and that group, but just a brutal loss for North Carolina. Eliminates him, in my opinion, eliminates him from the college football playoff contention. They still have Duke and Clemson left on the schedule. Remember, no divisions in the ACC anymore. So we'll see if this slip up ends up costing him a berth in the ACC championship game as well. Ted, that's a bad loss. Yeah. And number one, North Carolina is, it's very difficult for me to watch on television. I, Are you distracted by the beautiful blue? I don't know. It's hard for me to like flip the switch that I'm watching serious football. It's weird. <laughs> I it just I it, what the hell does that even mean? It means that I have I, been, I've been programmed, I've been indoctrinated. Whatever you want to say, like logo matters to me. 
I said it. Was that last weekend when I said, like, I just don't see them as a contender? We're the same. Oh, my gosh. Look at us. I, I just can't. I'll, I'll, I'd rather watch like almost anything else. It's not even that I'd rather. Like, I just can't stay locked in. I don't know what it is. I, don't, I can't explain it. We need I can't a force myself to keep the television there. Uh, we need to. <laughs> Maybe we should consult a Clemson sports psychologist about why you feel this way. I need to be deprogrammed. I don't know. I'm guessing you didn't laugh at my joke, so I'm guessing you didn't see what Dabo said. Oh, no. Is there something new? Oh, yeah. Uh Uh-oh. Now, North Carolina's loss is going to distract some of the ACC people from the fact that Clemson lost to Miami. They asked him, basically, hey, do you have a sports psychologist for these situations? And he said, yeah, probably on suicide watch right now. (laughs) Oh, geez. Just one thing after another with this guy, man. It is... Just something every week it feels like now with Dabo Switty. It's he's truly a content machine though, so I'm not he gonna is. I'm not gonna complain. But yeah, that one didn't go over well as you could imagine. About like the Michigan State video board. Yeah. <laughs> I love college football, man. It's the best. <laughs> it is the best. All right. Couple things on that loss. For North Carolina. No, first of all, Tony Musket is about as cool of a quarterback name as you're going to find. I mean, and I thought he wasn't perfect, man, but that guy played his tail off. I thought he did some really good things with his legs as well. Like that, that guy played really, really well. But Drake May, there's just something missing for me with Drake May. He missed a lot of throws. Now, you look at the stats, right? 347 and two touchdowns. But this was against Virginia. He's 24 of 48 against Virginia. And he just, he never looks very comfortable in the pocket. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. Uh, had some misses on some deep balls where he just, like the ball just goes out of bounds. Missed some crucial throws in the fourth quarter. He's supposed to be that dude, right? I know. And and Virginia gave North Carolina a gift. They fumbled the ball through the end zone for a touchback with, with five minutes to go, or else that game is put away right there. Yeah. And Drake May in that North Carolina offense, Tez Walker's a stud, by the way. Whoa. They had multiple opportunities. Hey, go win the game. If Drake, if you're supposed to be that dude, you go and win the game. He he makes he makes a lot of great plays, but you know, usually a, a quality of really good players is like I think about Kyler Murray. He makes whenever he was quarterback at Oklahoma, he made the incredible look really really easy and he makes the easy look like a walkthrough drake may when i watch him i feel like he makes everything no matter what look incredibly difficult you know what i'm saying yeah it's like even the routine for him it's like he's you're always like hanging on for your your seat like is this going to be like a critical error is he going to like totally whiff on this pass. There's something there about him that I, I'm with you. It just he looks like everything is way too chaotic. He also he's a big guy and he kind of plays little. Yeah. He's like, like six four, two thirty five. He you know, in a game like that, you gotta have a sense of the moment. Right, you're gonna have to take some hits, man. You're gonna have to go get some extra yards with your legs, and I don't know, just I I don't know. It just he at this point in time he does not do it for me. I don't know how to describe it other than that. But if I could, if I could take Cam Rising's brain and place it into Drake May's body, 
you would have yourself hell on wheels. The best quarterback ever. <laughs> right. Yeah. But, and I feel like this brings this entire episode full circle. Guess who ran the push QB sneak on fourth and short? Virginia. The winner of, the winner of this football game. Virginia. And it worked. And guess what they ended up going and doing on that drive? They scored a touchdown. It's not that hard. You can do it, college teams. Just put your quarterback under center. If Musket can do it, your guy can do it. The only other thought I have on this game is I feel like Virginia's logo is super underrated. It's an awesome logo. The V with the, like, sword sabers. I don't know what you call them underneath. Uh, yeah. Pretty sweet. They had some all whites on. I don't, I really liked the way it looked. Now, maybe it had everything to do with them hitting Drake May at the end and picking him off and them celebrating in the icy whites. I don't know, but the logo's good. I don't think that football team's very good, but, hey, they beat North Carolina on Saturday. So They don't, they don't need to be good all season. They just needed to be good last night. No doubt. Birthday shout-outs. Happy 37th birthday to Ryan Lamley. Is that right? L-A-M-M-L-E, Lamley? I think so. Lamley, I Lamley. It's got to be one of those. Lamel? Lamel. Oh, my L gosh. Lamel? We Lamel, Lamel, Lamley, <laughs> Lamley. We covered them all. Ryan, happy birthday. <laughs> happy 69th birthday to Joel Papaqua. Wakaqua. Papaqua, Wakaqua. I think yeah. you nailed it. Papa Qua Walker Qua. I like that. And welcome to the world, Callahan John Oliver. And on that note, episode 364 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Wednesday. We'll be previewing the OU Kansas game. Just a reminder, you can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on the ref. You can hear me from 2 to 5 on Sirius X and Big 12 Radio, channel 375. Hope you all have a great start to your week. A reminder, more in the weeds content coming. So make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Do it. It's free. Do it. And until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening. Do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.